احمده واصلي على رسول الكريم فقال عز وجل فباي الاء ربكما تكذبان رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين يا رب العالمين So Sheikh Cameron asked me to talk about shukr and kufr. Today, fortunately or unfortunately, I'm in a little bit of a, you can say, a semi-academic mood. So I want to talk about the history of kufr. The Jan will have something written on his forehead. We all know what that is. Kaf, Fa, and Ra, Kufr. What does that mean? To explain what this means, let me go back in history and explain to you why we are collectively, globally, in a state of kufr. So, Tariq bin Ziyad, radiallahu anh, when he was conquering Spain, he came to a new land. When you're in a new land, you need help. So the Jewish community in Spain, the Jews in Spain, they were living in ghettos. They were not allowed in the cities. They were living separate because, let me also mention this quickly, that the European world was basically pagan. They believed in Zeus and Hercules and all these pagan gods. But then, Christianity, when Constantine became Christian, the whole Christian world became Christian, or the whole European world, at that time where they ruled, became Christian. Now when the Christians became the rulers, they had to now take out their anger on the ones who killed their god which was the Jewish community. So one of the things that they had done is they had told the Jewish people, you cannot come into the cities. They had told the Jewish people that when you're doing business and you come into the cities, you can only come from this time to this time. You're allowed in the city to do your business and then you have to go back. Just like when Yusuf ﷺ, when he came to Egypt, and because he helped the king of Egypt in regards to the financial upheaval that would happen, what happened as a result, Bani Israel and Yusuf and his progeny, they had a high rank amongst the community over there. Just like that, in the same manner, when Tariq bin Zayyad went into Spain and the Jews were being repressed, and oppressed. The Jewish people helped the Muslims in conquering Spain and told them, you take this pathway, and for this you take this pathway, and this city, and that city, and this person, and that person. And the Muslims, when they conquered Spain, because the Jewish people had helped the Muslims, they came, even at one point, the, uh, the second in command to the Khalifa was a Jew in Spain. You know the, what's his name, go, go, the first Prime Minister of Israel, Gorion, Gorion, uh, huh? Ben Gorion. Ben Gorion mentioned at one point that that the Jewish history, the history of Jews in Spain is their golden years. 
Because now when Muslims went to Spain, what happened? They established universities in Cordoba, in different parts of Spain. And the way Muslims come to Western universities, at Yale or Harvard or different universities, non-Italians, French, Spanish, thinkers, intellectuals used to go to Spain to learn. And what did they learn? They learned, oh, these people believe you can question Umar bin Khattab radiallahu. These people, they believe in freedom. These people, so they learned from the Muslims. And they still have those traditions of learning from the Muslims. For example, when you're doing your graduation, you have your graduation hat, you have your robe, you have the robe of the Qadi still today, right? There's so many things. But Muslims in Spain affected and took Europeans out of the Dark Ages. And what was the result of that? When they added their own spice, you can say to that education, or they added their own aspects to their education. Just as a side point, the greatest Christian philosopher is known as St. Augustine. Okay. St. Augustine literally copies Imam Ghazali word to word in some parts of his writings that is still available for a person to compare, to just give you an idea of the level of influence. Word to word copy. And there's, not, there's only one person, but there's several European intellectuals who had been copying Muslim texts and writing it as their own texts in their own names. Now when what did the, in this time that these intellectuals are learning from the, from the Muslims and they're coming back with this knowledge, taking the world out of superstition into a world of rationality, what was the jurisdiction that the church had? The church made it haram to study science. The church made it haram to study philosophy. The church made it haram to study all these different sciences. The end result was the Christian Reformation with Martin Luther and they said, we don't want this Pope, we don't accept this Pope, we will, we will study the Bible for ourselves. This is where Protestantism started, the Christian Reformation. And the result of the Christian Formation and the 99 theses that Martin Luther hung on the door of the church. Was it 100 or 99? 99. <coughs> so when they did away with the church and rebelled against the church, the result was what we have as a long consequence of today. That now you study knowledge, but no mention of God. You study biology, but don't mention God. You study philosophy, don't mention God. You study physics, the miraculous universe, don't mention God. Knowledge was, you can say, Collab was aligned in such a way that now because the church was wrong so now don't mention God when it comes to knowledge then even till today when we study subjects does anyone teach physics and mention God do you know what a big travesty this is that you study a subject, any subject of knowledge without mentioning God, this is something completely foreign prior to this event. That it's taboo to say that, oh subhanAllah, how Allah created the water cycle. Right? Because the salt has to be in the water to preserve 
to make it antibacterial. Okay? The salt has to be in the oceans to make it antibacterial. And then Allah creates the water cycle to give you the fresh water while preserving all of the water with salt. I'm giving an example. Now in this, no one can say, or it is taboo to say, or it's taboo to write a paper saying, you know, the miracle of God in the water cycle. So the first thing that went, the first thing that went historically, was subjects began to being taught without the mention of God, without the mention of Allah. Second thing that happened after that, the Pope and the King. The end result of that process of taking away God from knowledge, removing God from the discourse of any knowledge, rather making it taboo to talk about God. In the discourse of knowledge itself, the result of that was the Pope is bad and the King is bad and we need secular societies. We don't want a Pope, we don't want a King because the King is blessed by the Pope and the King is the King because God wants him to be the King because he's blessed by the Pope. So we don't want this religious archetype, you know, a hierarchy. We don't want a religious hierarchy. We want a secular, we want God out of the government. And so they say church and state are separate. Meaning, don't mention God when it comes to public society. The third thing that happened, first thing that happened, knowledge removed, or Allah removed as part of the discourse of any knowledge. Second thing that happened, Allah removed and divine laws removed from any government in terms of governmental legal policies that would be established. No mention of God in the public sphere. In fact, I say this often but it's worth saying, the role of religion in modernity, please try to understand where the trick of shaitan is. The role of religion in modernity is that the people who are suffering, they need God. If you are in jail, you need a chaplain. If you are in the hospital, you need a chaplain. But do not bring God to the White House. Do not bring God into the public sphere. Do not bring God into our policies of economics. Do not bring God into our policies of social engineering. Do away with God in the domain of knowledge, human knowledge. All human knowledge will be learned without the mention of Allah. And if you mention Allah, you're not an intellectual. It's a taboo to mention God. Number two, we will form governments that have nothing to do with God. And number three, the phase that we're in now, we will have morality without God. What we experienced or what humanity went through in the Women 2000 conference in Beijing, the points that they had enumerated at that time, 20 years ago, you're beginning to see them come true today. You all know that the only countries that used to allow man to marry man were these Scandinavian countries, Denmark and these countries. Then the United States was the most conservative of them. Now you get married, you get registered. Morality without God. Government without God. All domains of knowledge don't mention God. And the only role of religion now is those that are suffering, they need God. If you're a religious person, you want to help the homeless, very good, help the homeless. But don't question why they became homeless. You want to help patients of AIDS? You want to build hospitals to help people that have AIDS? 
Build the hospitals that help the people of AIDS, but don't question that lifestyle that leads them to that hospital. What does what I'm saying have to do with kufr? I'm coming there. So, let's see, I will mention this point and then we'll move forward. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran as the last statement of Iblis to Allah. The last statement that Iblis says to Allah before he's kicked out. The last one statement Iblis says to Allah before he's kicked out is Wala tajidu aktharahum shakirin. Oh Allah, you will not find most of them to be in a state of shukr to you. When you remove Allah from the domain of knowledge itself, wholesale, when you remove Allah from governmental policies, when you remove Allah from morality, this is kufr. When you cannot mention Allah, when you cannot, because kufr, kufr means to cover up something, cover up the truth. The biggest kufr that has ever, ever, ever happened in human history is this phenomenon that's happened in the West that was a local phenomenon and then they globalized it. Meaning the three points I mentioned, morality without God, government without God, and knowledge without God. This is the highest level of covering up the truth. And so, it is of no wonder that in Surah Ar-Rahman, the surah in which Allah mentions and starts by His mercy, Ar-Rahman Al Qur'an, the most compassionate, the Rahman, the most merciful, taught Qur'an, which is also an indication that teaching and mercy go together. But in this surah, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions His mercy, Allah asks over and over and over and over again, 33 times, the biggest question asked in the entire Quran, 33 times, And that applies at no time and no age more than now. Which of Allah's bounties and powers will you continue to deny? Why does Allah ask the same question 33 times? I'll tell you. When a teacher is teaching, when a teacher is what? teaching and the student is not getting it when you repeat when do parents repeat the same question over and over again when they're upset that is the asnoob of language that is the style of language that you repeat yourself over and over again when you're upset with something and Allah is saying I'm ar-Rahman wa'allam al-Quran I created khalaq al-insan I gave man the power to speak and the power to discover. Look at this world I created. You're denying me. You're denying me. You're denying me. You took me out of the domain of knowledge itself. You took me out of all governmental policies. No mention of God at the public level. You took me out of morality. Which of your Lord's powers and miracles will you continue to deny? 
The anger is severe. But Allah is telling us, the only reason I've not gotten rid of you is because I'm Ar-Rahman, Allam al-Qur'an, Khalaq al-Insan, Allam al-Bayyan. Now, what is the philosophy of shukr? And in that we will study this philosophy of kufr. How much time do I have? Because I know that I can continue. Huh? Okay. You know, because sometimes when I get in the mood, I mean, I don't know, some people have seen my YouTube videos, I can like really go on. So. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and you'll see how this connects with what I was saying before to what I'm about to say now. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُكْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنِشْكُدْ لِلَّهِ We gave Lukman hikmah anishkud lillah so that he would be thankful to Allah. وَمَنْ يَشْكُدْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ The one who thanks Allah, thanks Allah for his own good. وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيُّ الْحَمِيدِ Whoever denies and is unthankful, Kufr has two opposites in the Qur'an. One kufr, the opposite of the word kufr is iman. One opposite of the word kufr in Qur'an is what? Iman. The other opposite in Qur'an of the opposite of kufr is shukr. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala many times brings these two together. For example, Sukhulukman. وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُكْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ أَنِشْكُرْ لِلَّهِ وَمَنْ يَشْكُرْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَنِيُّ الْحَمِيدِ In the same way, Mr. Dhahr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّا حَذَيْنَهُ السَّبِيلِ And we gave man the pathway. إِمَّا شَاكِرًا وَإِمَّا كَفُورًا Either you become people of shukr or you become people of kufr. Opposite of kufr is shukr. And opposite of kufr is Iman. This means if you have Iman, you must have shukr. And so the Fatiha, what do we say? Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. And what is the goal of shaitan? وَلَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرَهُمُ الشَّاكِرِينَ You will not find most of them being thankful to you. Most of us, we say Alhamdulillah. But shaitan says, you will Allah not find most of them thankful to you. What is shukr? Shukr is a very, 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 very interesting human phenomenon. They discovered shukr in the West about 10 years ago. A new field of psychology was developed because of this concept of shukr. It's called positive psychology. Positive psychology is a new branch within psychology that was developed after they discovered that shukr is also a human emotion. And they discovered after research, after research, after research, after research, I think more than 175 very, very well documented and often cited case studies and research work they found out that people that are in a state of gratitude are better in all aspects of their life, in their relationships, in their, their physiology, in their health, in their well-being, the overall well-being, gratitude does like. So Allah says, وَمَنْ يَشْكُرْ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِي If you do thank, if you thank Allah, if you're thankful, you're thankful for your own good. It does you good to be thankful. وَمَنْ كَفَرَ فَإِنَّ اللَّهِ you know, If you're doing kufr, if you're unthankful, Allah is ghaniyun hamid. He doesn't need you. He's self-praiseworthy, self-sufficient. He doesn't need you. But there's another aspect of shukr. And that is that shukr is the litmus test of your fitrah. It is the litmus test to see how human you are. What is that? If... 
Brother Muhammad does something good to me, then if I have good fitra, I must necessarily feel something inside me that wants to reciprocate that goodness. Either with dua or someday I tell myself, well, he did this good to me today. I'm going to find another day to do equally or more to him. Kufr is the opposite of that. Denial of truth and covering the truth and being ungrateful is the opposite of that. The human, the good human being is the one, and this is why Quran after this, in Sutul Luqman, what is Sutul Luqman famous for? Talking about the rights of the parents. وَوَصَيْنَ الْإِنسَانَ بِوَالِدَيْهِ حَمَلَتْ أُمُّهُ وَحْنًا عَلَىٰ وَحْنًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala advises you and commands you regarding your parents and your mother who weaned you for two years of weakness upon weakness. Why? Because if you have, if you don't have shukr to your parents, then you have failed the litmus test. If you can't be good to your parents, kufr is to do what psychology teaches us today, is to look at your parents from a negative perspective. The way out of that hole, even if they did some wrong, is to actually be thankful for whatever good came out of it. And so, shukr is the litmus test. What is that litmus test? If someone does you good, and you don't feel that you need to reciprocate that, you don't feel you owe them something, I'm not talking about the commercial smile and the commercial thank you that they give you at Walmart. <laughs> okay? Where they give you a receipt and they say thank you. You know, they know it works because thank you or shukr causes reciprocation. Thank you for your business. Then you automatically, as a good human being, want to give that business. But as a human being, if someone does good to you, do you feel, how much do you feel, how sensitively do you feel, I have to pay them back for the good that they've done to me? This is the litmus test of how good of a human being. So if there's shukr, and you feel shukr, and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةَ We gave Luqman hikmah, anishkur lillah, so that he will do shukr to Allah. Why? Because you can't have hikmah unless you are on fitrah. You can only do shukr if you're on fitrah. And you can only have hikmah, not knowledge, hikmah, wisdom, knowing the essence of things. So now the question we have to ask is, am I in a state of shukr? Or am I in a state of kufr? Imam Ghazali takes this to the next level. He says this feeling of shukr, where I know I'm alive because of my parents, I'm alive because of the people around me. You know, a child grows up, he sees, oh, parents take care of me. Then he grows up a little bit more, he sees, my relatives are taking care of me. He grows up a little bit more, he sees that the whole area is, the whole environment, the whole question is, okay, where does this ultimate shukr ultimately goes where? It goes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning this feeling. And so what am I saying? This is what kufr does. And let me see how well I can elucidate this quickly. When you have an environment that takes a lot out of the domain of knowledge, when you have an environment that takes a lot out of the domain of government, of policies, of laws, no concept of the divine, when you have Allah taken out of the concept of morality, then what happens as a result? Because shukr, now listen to what I'm about to say, it's a very important point. Shukr is to find something extraordinary in something that is seemingly ordinary. 
Shukr is the human condition, the human perception to find something extraordinary in something that is seemingly ordinary. For example, your dish, your food. If I have a dish in front of me, there's some rice, there's some salad. If I'm in a state of kufr, is this food? Just like animals eat, I eat. I have urges, I need to satisfy my urges, I'm hungry, I will eat, that's it. But a person of shukr makes that ordinary plate into something, an extraordinary thing, because he's thinking about, subhanAllah, imagine where this rice came from. Imagine where this meat came from. And that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decided to put all these things from thousands of miles away into my plate. It is about looking at everything that is ordinary and finding the extraordinary in it. This is shukr. It is about looking at a tree. It's just a tree, seemingly just a tree. We're so used, we're so amazed with technology. With the, with the technology we have, especially with the AI that's now, nowadays going on. We're so amazed with technology, the way we should be amazed, actually be amazed by the ordinary and finding the extraordinary in the ordinary. Instead of that, we become amazed by what? By things of new progress and technology and the new car and the new thing. And so this society that wants more and more and thankless and more and you know every every stock market anybody who's done stock market or listened to the market you know it's about what was the, what they make a forecast this is how much we're predicting right the next the next Microsoft quarterly report this is how much gains we expect they forecast it can you imagine like how kufr that is like you're trying to forecast your income, that your profit, right? To show to the world that, you know, there's no like up and down like a wave. There's no concept like that in the marketplace. It's all supposed to go all the way up. And so, this state of completely looking at the mundane as mundane. Food is just food. It's there for fulfilling my urges. Nothing special about it. Water, the water cycle, we study the water cycle, but we don't see it as something amazing because we're not taught of it as something amazing. How oxygen works in the human body, how we can walk. If gravity was too much, we couldn't walk properly. If gravity was too light, we couldn't walk properly. Right? Finding the extraordinary in the ordinary. If that amazes you, you have shock. But if you're more impressed with technology and the things that man makes over the things that Allah makes, then you are in a state of kufr. You're more impressed with our tall buildings than you are with the trees. You're more impressed with our technology than the medicine in the leaves. This is what this society is pressuring us to be. To be animals who are just satisfying their instincts, who no longer really can think. You can have a PhD, but you have no insight. And so you're, you're eating like an animal. I have, I have, I'm hungry, I'm eating. But you're never thinking about Allah beyond, because you're only thinking about your urges. When you take Allah out of the domain of knowledge, when you take Allah out, Allah's, you throw Allah's laws away into the garbage can. When you take Allah out of morality, then what will be left of a human being except that he will function as an animal? And when a human being functions as an animal, that is kufr. When you are working based upon your animal instincts and not your higher angelic self, 
the angelic self will look at everything Allah has created and be amazed by it. I remember one of my shaykhs was telling me, this is just to give an anecdotal point, and I don't want to talk too much, but one of my shaykhs was telling me that he was describing one of the other shaykhs from Singapore, and he was talking about how when he would, this shaykh, when he would see something new, how he would fall into curiosity. And look at it and say, like, see how Allah made this? Right? And look at how Allah designed this? Like, subhanAllah. But we've lost that. Because we are always running after our impulses. I'm talking about myself. Our urges. And we take everything for granted. And we have a sense of entitlement. Why? Because we live in a society that tells us Allah is not part of the equation. And so what are we trying to do sitting here? We're trying to make Allah part of the equation of our life. But the more there is the pressure of kufr, the more you need to put the pressure on the opposite side. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us amongst the people who do shukr to Allah. May Allah make us amongst the people who are more amazed with Allah's creation and Allah's doings than the creation and the doings of man. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those people that recognize how this world is changing. How there is kufr on this system itself. How this whole system, from the minute you're born to you grow up, you're taught to take everything as granted. Your parents are taken for granted. Your, your, everybody in your life is taken for granted. Everything is for granted. Everything is just there to serve you. Not a gift from Allah. Not a miracle from Allah. And so this is the dilemma of the modern Muslim man, or the person, meaning human beings. The, the dilemma of the modern Muslim is, how do I learn to really thank Allah? How do I learn to look at His creation, be amazed by it? In a time where there's more facts of how amazing nature is, and Allah's creation is, the less we are convinced compared to the people before that it's amazing. Even though we have more knowledge. But because we grew up in public schools or we grew up in schools with knowledge being taught without God, so everything we look at, we assess it without Allah as part of the equation. So I will just end here.